Well, I often kick off the show with Julia Lee from Berman Invest. And tonight I want to talk to her about the tech stocks that Julia Lee loves. <laughs> Hi, Pete. And you are, you are a lover of stocks. Like you, you, you dump stocks, like you dump a boyfriend when you were young. Oh. You, just, you really love stocks and you, you really go full on and love stocks, don't you? I do, I do. Um, and look, the tech space is a bit of a hard place to navigate only because of the valuation side of things. And I guess the difficult part is falling in love with a stock or falling in love with a story. Um, but in the tech space, I think it's really important to look at the growth trajectory and what the growth profile is going to look like. And certainly there are some companies which are great companies, but just are looking too expensive in that space. Okay, so why don't we start off with some of the, the tech stocks that you either love or just kind of like. <laughs> I guess when we have a look at tech stocks, valuations firstly on the Aussie share market are very expensive for tech stocks. For stocks like Appen as well as Altium, both that I like, they have PE ratios of 40 to 60. And with WiseTech, there's a PE ratio of 130 times. So, so things are really expensive in the tech space, which means if these technology companies take a misstep, then the share price will be punished. I prefer to look at those technology stocks, which are a bit earlier on in their business journey. So stocks like email payments, where I do believe that it's going to be a huge growth sector. And that acquisition they made of PFP as well means that they're going to be able to offer financial services to fintechs. So I think that's one exciting one for the longer term. So looking at three to five years at least. Um, and Tyro is another one which should recover well once we do start to see a bit more retail traffic happening. The other side of things is that I do like the utility type of tech stocks. So this working from home, uh, we've seen a massive demand for data centers coming through. So I think Next DC still has a bright future. I think that structural shift to cloud will mean that we do consume more data and that these data centers will be in high demand. And then Telstra is also an interesting one, a very traditional mm -hmm. company. And Pete, you know that I'm very selective with when to buy Telstra. And I do think that it's things like new products, new management, new strategy, which often give uh, the ability of a company to increase the value of a business. And with 5G coming to the forefront, I think Telstra is in a good position. And look, at around about the $3 mark, I think you're getting a bargain over the next five years. Okay. Now, there'll be a lot of people listening to you and saying, well, I wonder if Julia is worried that maybe there might be another big leg down. You are buying stuff, I know, you, and, you, and a lot of stuff you said you were buying last week did well last week. But are you worried about an, an, another leg down, a big leg down, or maybe a pullback just so the market is more sensible? The probability is always there. I always thought that the market would retrace back up to the 5,800 point level. And Pete, the reason why 5,800 points is significant is the 50% retracement level. So from the peaks that we saw in February down to the lows in March, 5,800 points is that level. So if we can confidently get past that level, I think that's a good test for the market. Of course, if we do see severe lockdowns, then of course that story um, becomes more tenuous. So look, I do think that the worst of the lockdowns are behind us. The more time goes on, the better we become with COVID-19, understanding it and using technology to be able to control COVID-19 without these huge economic uh, consequence having um, lockdown. So look, I do think things are getting better. And look, today the manufacturing numbers out of China, we're seeing growth in the manufacturing space, mm. which is pretty incredible given where China was at the start of the year. Uh, Julia, do you ever, yeah, you very seldom talk about it, but do you ever factor in things like riots in the USA that might worry Wall Street and then that has a knock-on effect uh, for our market? I am I'm constantly thinking about the implications. Um, I guess the, the riots 
in the US. They're horrific at the moment, but also those protests are spreading to places like the UK. And I'm just having a look at some of the looting and the consequence for retailers. Of course, Unibail Rotterra has shopping centers over in California, the US, as well as in the UK. In fact, one of the UK protests initially started in one of the Westfield shopping centers before police moved uh, the protest to outside the shopping center. So just watching things like that, because in a weak retail environment, some of the retailers that have been hit, well, what happens if they decide not to come back and not to rebuild again? So watching that retail space and the consequences, um, and look, it is pretty horrific watching it. But in terms of recovery, the China recovery at the moment does give the rest of the world hope, given that it is ahead of the curve in terms of COVID-19. And of course, just watching other impacts like Brazil, where the situation is getting worse and iron ore prices are being well supported because of that. Mm. Well, last one, Julie, Robert got loose. Some in the Australian today talked about there's a home improvements boom going on. Um, have companies like you know, Harvey Norman, um, Bunnings, have they been beneficiaries of this? Look, West Farmers has been a big beneficiary because it owns Bunnings, Bunnings as well as Office Works. So it's been a, a beneficiary of the gardening boom that we've seen as well as the working from home boom. But of course, as people return back to work, which will happen from, uh, slowly start to happen from June, we'll start to see some of those positive impacts disappearing. So I guess the question to ask with the COVID-19 impacts is, is it temporary or is it forever? And some of the structural trends that have been accelerated will be very sticky. So our move to cloud, our need for online, online sales, these things will be quite sticky, but other things will unwind as conditions normalize. So having more time to enjoy in the garden because we don't have to travel to work, this will slowly unwind over the next 18 months. So you mean to say you'll do less gardening and more turning up to pubs after work? <laughs> you know me too well, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us on the program. Thanks, Pete. Well, my next guest is Ju He. She's Senior Portfolio Manager for Murray. Uh, this is a South Korean business focused as well, headquartered in Hong Kong, and they have extensive investments here in Australia as well, uh, one of which most of us knows, namely beta shares. Ju He, welcome to the program. Hi, um, good morning. So Ju He, why don't you tell us about the company Murray itself? Um, actually, we are headquartered in Seoul. We founded, yes. So um, we founded in, uh, in 1997. And in 1998, we were the first company to, to actually provide a re, the mutual fund to retail, retail investors in South Korea. And then uh, currently, uh, under the group, we have asset management and uh, wealth management, investment banking, and then life insurance. So we are actually the one of the largest um, the financial group in emerging markets. And um, now currently, I and my um, my team members in, in equity investment team are all based in Hong Kong, just like you mentioned. So actually the core, uh, the office for the regional products, regional Asian products are all based in Hong Kong. But also we have offices in Shanghai, Mumbai, Seoul, uh, all, the, all the, um, the major cities. So we have 15 offices across the 12 countries now. Okay. And and, but I think uh, to, uh, sorry, so to Australian uh, audience, I think, uh, um, they probably think that Mirez is the owner of uh, the Four Seasons Hotel in Sydney yeah. and also the major shareholder of uh, Beta Share. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. certainly a lot of our investors have had a lot to do with Beta Shares. And uh, yes, the right. Four Seasons Hotel, a very mm -hmm. nice hotel indeed. <laughs> I guess it sh does show the diversification of the business. So why don't you tell us about your prime function for the company? Uh, my function? Um, so I'm managing the Asia Great Consumer Fund, which is it, which is investing in direct beneficiary of consumption growth in Asia. So this is one of our flagship products because we strongly believe that consumption growth is a major growth engine for Asian economy, and then now it's becoming actually the growth engine for global economy as well. 
So some people think that um, the emerging market could be more volatile, but actually as long as you pick the right stock, which is benefiting from this long-term trend, but actually the beta was much lower with a sustainable alpha almost every year since inception. Yeah. So, so basically what you're saying is that there is a discernible consumer pattern and you try to pick those companies that are most likely to benefit from that strong consuming pattern mm -hmm. in Asian countries, not just China, right around the, the, Asian, um, uh, the Asian region? Yeah, so China, of course, is very, very important, but also we see opportunities in India and other emerging Asian countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, and Thailand. So uh, now currently in my fund, the majority two major countries and markets are India and China. So in China, uh, we see a lot of opportunities coming from the next level of consumption, not just you know, necessity related ones. So for example, tourism or um, some consumer services to take care of the quality of life. So now, uh, the inter if you look at the stage of the, the, the consumption patterns in, uh, in China, that kind of next level of consumption is more interesting. Um, that penetration is still very low. So for example, you see a lot of Chinese tourists, even in Sydney. And then now recently I saw the media news that uh, which is saying that the outbound tourist expenditure in China, of Chinese travelers, it's more than double that of the U.S. China, uh, uh, tourist. But still, if you look at the penetration of passport holder, that's only 10% of 1.4 billion population. So still, uh, the penetration is really low in the kind of uh, areas in China. Mm. But when it comes to India, for example, we see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, opportunities in necessity-related ones. For example, FMCG companies, or some hospital name, uh, which are all kind of uh, the basic, you know, the products and more branded uh, the products uh, rather mm -hmm. than just unbranded. So as we see that urbanization rate is going up in India, for example, the more and more people in rural area, they're going to move to branded products from unbranded products. So yeah, the mostly uh, overall, the penetration is much very low in Asia. Uh, but still, if you look at the country by country, then uh, you have to find, you can find a whole different con uh, different stories, yeah. uh, country by country. How, how many companies would be in that fund that you're talking about? Uh, now, currently, we are holding uh, 29 stocks. And since inception, which was 2011, uh, it was between 28 and 32. So the average number of stocks in the fund was about 30, 30 stocks. Obviously, the coronavirus has uh, really rattled many stock markets, and we know that when stock markets get pa uh, panicky, uh, uh, lots of people and funds uh, sell off. Do, do you think that that's created a lot of buying opportunities for the companies that you really want to have in the fund? Mm, yeah, well, there are, of course, our, if you look at our actually fund in fund characteristic, um, the turnover is not that high. So turnover annual turnover is only 30 to 40 percent, which means we are not like uh, trading funds. We don't do trading that much. Mm. So our basic strategy is just find out uh, the good company and the hold for a long term perspective. But just like you said, when something some events hap are happening in the market. And we see a very good opportunity for, for high quality names. And that's a good buying opportunity for us rather than just selling point. So just like you mentioned, this year we saw a very good entry point for good quality names uh, in China and in India and even in other uh, emerging ASEAN countries such as Philippines and Indonesia. So we actually we added more weights on those uh, high quality names mm. who were excessively um, you know, corrected. What are the the companies that you really like the most? Mm. Like if I if I asked a, a, a US fund manager, I'm sure that many of them would say Netflix and Amazon and <laughs> Facebook. What are what mm. are the companies that you really like to have in your fund? Mm. So uh, it's very different country by country. So first in China, uh, some education companies. Uh, very interesting. 
because the parents are eager to spend as much as possible on their kids, because especially in China, they have only one or two, mostly actually one kid still. And education company is very interesting. And also tourism, actually tourism sector is one of the most affected by COVID-19 pandemic. But from long term perspective, this kind of, you know, underperformance just driven by this pandemic, it's going to offer a good buying opportunity. So some airport name, for example, Shanghai International Airport, or some, some uh, duty-free operator in China, that sector is very interesting from mid to long-term perspective. And um, also now uh, other domestic tourism sector is also uh, very interesting to me because um, the outbound tourism, uh, I think it's going to take longer to recover because of the, um, it's going to take some time to see stabilization in Europe or in the US. So people are going to move uh, inside of the country more. That's why some Macau gaming is also uh, interesting. So, um, and um, that's kind of China, China story. And then when it comes to India, the portfolio is totally different. Um, in India, uh, still, FMCG companies are very interesting. The so household uh, and the products or some packaged food, um, they kind of more necessary related products are still very much under penetrated. So we are uh, holding the leading companies who are going to consolidate the market. Um, so like Hindustan Unilever or Nestle or Britannia. And also we prefer uh, the consumer bank like HDFC Bank who is going to um, be very good in rural area going forward when the urbanization rate is going up. So uh, when it, that's India. And then when it comes to uh, South Korea and Taiwan, those are still expert driven economies. So actually from my perspective, there are not many stuffs to own. So if you look at my fund, actually in Taiwan, we have zero position. And in South Korea, only one company is included in, uh, in our fund because <laughs> uh, just, simply because we cannot find any good beneficiary from consumption growth in those markets. That's almost like a saturated market in terms uh, of consumption growth. Well, let, let me put you on the spot. Have any Australian companies ever qualified for your fund? Uh, well, the benchmark is Asia x Japan. It's not Asia Pacific x Japan. So we currently we do not have. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's good. Well, let's face it. I, th I guess in the perfect world, you, you want to be perceived as a company that Australians can invest in if they want mm -hmm. exposure to Asia. Tell us about the funds that Mirai have actually in Australia. Um, we made two flagship products available in Australian market. One is the Mirai SM Asia Great Consumer Fund that I'm managing. Um, and second one is Asia Sector Leader Fund. So the Asia Great Consumer Fund invests in uh, the, the, um, the, the beneficiaries of consumption growth, as I mentioned. Uh, and the more with more concentrated portfolio, but um, uh, Asia Sector Leader Fund um, is investing in more diversified uh, sectors with about 50 to 60 stocks in Asia. Your track record been, Juhi? Um, so the the fund which is available in I mean Australian Australian domicile fund is actually on, the track record is more than five years now. But if you look at master fund of that, uh, which is Luxembourg domicile fund, that's next week, it's going to be nine year track record fund. So um, since inception, I just checked the number. Um, we generated about 95% uh, 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 return since inception uh, from 2011 and uh, outperforming the benchmark by about a 60% point. So um, I just got informed that this Asia Great Consumer Fund uh, is one of the top ranked fund in uh, Asia Pacific Regional Funds. And Mirror S Asia Sector Leader Fund is also, uh, it has eight years of track record. Uh, if you look at its best master fund, and since inception, it was um, in top 30% uh, uh, among the peers. And are these listed funds? Uh, yes. yes. So, so they're both listed funds? Yes. Okay. And um, so in terms of the way you're going to be investing going forward, you know, there are a lot of people thinking, well, the, the bounce back of particularly the US stock market and the Australian market um, has been very strong. Are you expecting a, another significant uh, second leg down or are you more likely to expect maybe a pullback 
because we might have got ahead of ourselves. I mean, um, I think going forward uh, in the market, I think uh, just like we saw from uh, NPC, just like we heard we heard from NPC meetings in China last week, um, now most of investors and also governments, they also think that the external demand is going to be very weak for the rest of this year and then maybe probably next year as well. So I think uh, the most important part of our economy in global market is domestic demand growth in emerging market because it is still very much under penetrated and still very uh, resilient, much more resilient. That's why uh, during the NPC, they also put much more focus on job market, which is employment rather than just overall GDP growth this time. This is a uh, uh, very uh, actually surprising impressive. And so uh, uh, even to US investors or Australian investors, I think this is a, this fund is a very good opportunity for them to have exposure to this most resilient part of uh, global economy. Um, so going forward, of course, I have to keep watching the employment and job market in, in China. And also, uh, of course, in, in India, still they are struggling uh, to the contain the coronavirus. So it's not done yet in that country. Uh, but, uh, but still, we saw that the governments, they released a very large size of um, the stimulus package. Um, and uh, in ASEAN, of course, when, if the tension between the US and China is going to escalate, then some ASEAN, emerging ASEAN countries like Vietnam, they are going to benefit from uh, this tension. Uh, so we have to just keep watching their, uh, their FDI uh, trend as well. So I think uh, even to like um, the developed market investors, this fund is very unique in terms of um, the opportunity uh, and then to diversify their exposure because um, this is very different from just normal, uh, the emerging market fund. This um, much since inception, actually, beta is only 0.85, although we just had a lot of you know, like a meaningful alpha compared to the benchmark. So, yeah. So as you hear, I guess what you're saying for people who don't fully understand what you're driving at is that because you're, the companies you buy in are more exposed to domestic demand within mm -hmm. the Asian economies, you're right. suggesting that they, they would be less threatened by a trade war between China and the USA. I think it could be even, yes, it could be even um, benefiting from it because yeah. they know uh, that consumption, domestic demand, and then consumption growth is becoming more and more important because they cannot rely on external demand anymore. So in terms of the, a lot of reforms and sort kind of deregulations in various sectors to boost mm -hmm. consumption, it has been uh, much stronger than previous governments. And before, in the past, you know, uh, previous governments also talked about a lot of measures and policies, but actually they, they, in terms of execution, it was much weaker. But now finally, we are seeing that much stronger execution of those reforms and then their, their, the policies they have been talking about. So I think uh, still there are a lot of uncertainties coming from this, this pandemic and also US-China uh, tension. And, but I think this consumption in emerging markets, mm. it's most resilient uh, part and growth engine for uh, global economy. So Juhi, if people are interested, how can they get in more information? Um, so in Australia, our fund, this Asia Great Consumer Fund, is available to investors via PDS and Network, uh, NetWealth and Hub24 platforms. Great stuff. Thanks for joining us on the program. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Well, it's that time of the day. It's that time of the show when we catch up with Charlie Aiken of Aiken Investment Management and our colleague Paul Rickard from the Switzer Report. And I want to talk today about, given the fact that the market has rebounded and people are wondering whether they should, should, could, should keep on buying or whether they should wait for maybe a bit of a pullback before they buy again, is how do you actually pick good and bad companies based on their balance sheets? And Charlie actually wrote about this in the Switzer Report and Paul has always been a keen analyzer of balance sheets. So they're the perfect guys to talk about. Charlie, Give us your best shot on you know, using the balance sheet to pick a good company. 
Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's very simple analysis. You look at the, the cash on the balance sheet versus the debt that they have, et cetera, and see how long they could survive operating under a, a tough environment. It's how we really look at things. So it's really, you know, it's a, the ratio really of free cash flow and how much cash they generate. You can, we only value a company by the cash it generates, not by its PE or anything like that. What is the cash worth and discount that cash into the future and come up with a valuation. But for us, it's really about the amount of cash a business holds and how long it can see through a tough period. Yeah. And an unexpected tough period like this, actually, where a lot of people were caught with a little, way too little cash in the corporate world. You've seen in Australia, 20 billion of raisings, of equity raisings. Mm. And so, look, for me, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sign of durability. It's a sign of strength. But it's an essential part of investment analysis is looking at balance sheets, but particularly in a period like this. Is there a formula where you compare the cash to the debt? Yeah, there's mo multiple different formulas. Mm. I don't say there's one all-encompassing formula. Yeah. One of the things we look at basically to decide whether it's a good company or a great company or not is whether its return on invested capital is higher than its cost of capital. Mm. Then you are making money. You are making an economic profit. Mm. And I think that's really important because there's plenty of businesses that don't actually make an economic profit that the market uh, pays, you know, pays reasonable multiples. So, so, yeah, the returns they make are higher than the cost of their capital. Mm. Well, For Australian companies, it's probably just a little harder. There's not, yeah, not some, some of the data that you have in the US. But look, um, here's a tip for anyone out there. You can just Google their credit rating. Not every company has a credit rating, but no. uh, most of the big ones do. And as long as you get the current one, you, that'll come up from Standard & Poor's or Moody's. And, and that get, it's not exactly the same as Charlie's talking about, but it's pretty close. A strong close. reflector on it. Yeah, so it? you can see whether you know, Standard & Poor's has got an A- minus or triple B or triple B-, minus, okay. whatever it is. Yeah. And it gives you a guide to uh, at least what the, the credit analysts mm -hmm. uh, think about the strength of the balance okay, sheet. Okay, let's make this really simple because you know, Charlie's answer for Charlie was very sophisticated. Well, I'll give you a really and simple answer, Peter. No, no, I'm, a, no, I'm, a, I'm a simple sort yeah, of guy, yeah, Peter, so but, I gave yeah, the But for normal people who <laughs> yeah. listen to it, they would say, well, how do I work out return of investment? We'll get there well, in a minute. That's but, not for them to do. No, right? no, that's right. Okay. But as Paul points out, if someone wanted to, say, work out whether BHP had a good ratio yes. of cash to debt, how would they do it? Well, work, work us through okay, it. Okay, the first thing they do is they, they, go, to Google they just, or Yahoo. just go to their investor presentation. Yeah. You, if, you're, if you're on Comsec or NABTRADER, you go to the BHP uh, website, yep. download their last investor presentation, yep. and every single pack that BHP or Rio has got there has got some sort of chart of their free cash flow, yeah. right? And you look exactly how much cash they're spinning off and what they're investing it in. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, but if you just want to do the other way, the, it's just Google, put in BHP credit rating, yeah. and out will spit out, you know. That uh, was the much easier okay. answer. I could feel people glazing <laughs> over as you said, now go to, the, go to the presentation and look for free cash flow. No, people, that was a good answer. I think the other Charlie. thing to remember, in, you know, why I don't really look at PEs and things like that, is also when you type in market capitalisation. Mm. You know, a company with a lot of debt, might have a hundred billion market capitalization, the debt doesn't get mentioned. Company with a hundred billion with a huge amount of cash doesn't get mentioned. Mm. So they have a market cap of hundred. We look at enterprise value. Mm. So the enterprise value of a company, you add the debt on to see what the, the value yeah. of the company is, yeah. and, and vice versa with the cash, etc. So a, you can't, it's not that easy to compare things on just basic analysis of the size of the company mm. by market cap or PE or et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So look, I think Paul's thing of just, you know, having a quick, quick reference to the credit ratings helps. Yeah. And, as you know, in the recent period, credit rating has driven performance in equities mm. because people are going for balance sheet and durability because they're not exactly sure what comes next. And that's probably right. Mm. Okay. I should just point out that the analyst credit rating is not exactly the same no. as, as free cash flow and what no, Charlie was no. talking about, yeah. but it's a guide, right? Okay, good. It's now, a guide. So tell us a company that you use uh, both, uh, two companies that you have liked or disliked because of what you saw on their balance sheet. Well, in recent times, obviously, you know, there are reasonably big investments in U.S. tech yeah. because large cap U.S. tech generally has no debt and a huge amount of cash on balance sheet Lucky and, so and, and, so a, aren't they? and a bunch of bunch of free cash flow every day. And they're generally double A or A rated. Hmm. Now, in the recent times in America, while Wall Street's done well, Nasdaq's done better, driven by Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Facebook, you know, yeah. the usual suspects. It's actually a but it's balance sheet, point. but it's a balance sheet game. Hmm. They are the strongest companies in the world by balance sheet and under any, yeah. any circumstances. They do not need to raise capital. They're not doing anything. So that's been good. So an example of a stock I like there, which I've written about for you many times, is Microsoft. Yeah. An example of a stock that we got concerned about their balance sheet the other day and sold out of was Disney. Mm -hmm. You know, feeling that they've got too much debt from this Fox acquisition and their parks are closed and the cash flows down and there's no screening of, uh, at cinemas and that could get yeah. messy. 
So when you look after people... So even though they've got a new foray into, say, competing with Netflix... Yeah, but it's, it, it's not profitable. That's, that's not right. profitable. That's not profitable. That's not a cash machine. Yeah. That's actually burning cash, mm -hmm. even with 55 mm -hmm. million subscribers. Yeah. So that's one where we assess risk and go, OK, coronavirus, didn't quite see that coming. Mm -hmm. So a parks business and a, a cinema business and a, and, a, and a sports business, ESPN has no sport on at the moment, with a huge amount of debt. And you say, that's one we're actually selling. So Microsoft, we have a you know, strong, strong positive view on. Disney, we reassessed mainly because of the balance sheet in this environment. And Charlie, because ultimately you have um, customers who would look at your performance quarterly or monthly? Probably monthly. Monthly. Yeah. Uh, in this environment? Yeah. So you, you couldn't take a view on Disney, well, I'll, I'll buy them for three years. Eventually the parks will open, eventually movies will come, yeah. and, and eventually even this uh, play of streaming yeah, but, but will play. I, but it, I could have also years. said about that about Boeing mm -hmm. when the planes crashed and yeah. I sold out of those because yeah. they had a reasonably stretched balance sheet. But they've gone from four hundred dollars to one hundred and twenty. Yeah. Now, so you, you say you can see it through, but they can get a lot worse. If this coronavirus gets a second wave in America, mm -hmm. which it could if people are rioting, you know, mm -hmm. all sorts of things, yeah. you know, then Disney will be shut for a long time, and then the balance sheet is a real problem. So I, c I don't want to take that gamble with my investors' money. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of stocks I can invest in, you know, around the world mm -hmm. that you don't have to take that gamble. Okay, Paul, you, a good and a bad company based on balance sheet? Yeah, well, look, based on balance sheet, and I'll, I'll stick with the credit rating analogies to keep it simple, is, 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 is CSL. Now, it, it's got reasonable debt, so sometimes the debt to equity metric can be a bit bit flawed, but... So that's the way you put the little thing. Yeah, you, you but, love but it, 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 it is it's, priced to perfection. It, it's, it's, it's rated A minus, had a good rally today. It's got cheap. The rest of the market's gone up. It's been left behind. I think it just sort of got out of favour. A bit of a lot of a index... Rotation bit of rotation. Back. A lot of index funds had to buy into it to get market weight. Then they got market weight, and then the next thing happens, and so I think it's one of the reasons you're seeing CSL rally today. I mean, it, it, it can, you know, it's spending a lot of money on R&D, which a biotechnique or a you know, needs to do, it can turn that off if it needs to, right? So and and no, right. no discussion around not paying its 1% dividend there at all, right? Yeah. And, company, I, and I think in the Switzerland uh, report on Saturday, I actually said I was going to buy CSL. You did. Well, you missed a good rally. Uh, uh, well, I missed it. I hope Maureen's bought yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. Now, a, a company <laughs> I, I don't like, and which is uh, is Tapcorp, right? Now, that's yeah. triple B minus. Uh, bad takeover. Well, a good takeover for it if Tat's badly handled. Mm -hmm. It's closed down because of the, uh, the racing business is still going. The online staff's got a bit of two challenges, you know. Uh, I think it's got some challenges. So mm. it's, it hasn't, it's, it's, it's bottom, it's bounced quite nicely off the bottom, but yeah. uh, I think that company is going nowhere. Yeah, and I, and I think the, the TAB branches are now open, but the bottom line is that doesn't matter. You didn't like that company even when the branches are no, open. No, and it's, it's cut its dividend or suspended its dividend. Mm. So but yeah, you, it's just saying that it's, it's rated triple B minus, it's about four notches below CSL at A minus. Mm. Well, guys, anything else you'd like to say about uh, balance sheets before we move well, on? I think the other thing off you know, with balance sheets as well is also sustainable dividend yield. What is a sustainable payout ratio? Mm. You, know, you don't want companies paying out 90 95% of their, their profits. You want them to retain some of that cash to expand or reinvest it or for a rainy day that we've recently had. So mm. I would just be in all this conversation about balance sheet and cash flow, be aware of dividend payout ratios mm. and that anything sort of above 50 60% I think mm. is, you know, is Probably not that prudent. All right, one final question. We, we've already slightly touched on it. The, the comeback of the banks last week, I wrote that I thought part of it was driven by the fact that the Aussie economy is looking a bit better now than you might have thought four weeks ago. The JobKeeper payment mm. is supposed to be over six million, now it's going for three million people. Even the, the uh, Reserve Bank Governor said to the COVID-19 committee meeting that he thought the, the health outcomes were so good that there probably will be an economic dividend. Do you think that's been factored in, um, Charlie? Well, it was a hell of a short squeeze. You don't mm. see 25% moves in four days that often, so yeah. I don't think everyone made money out of it. Mm. You know? And I think if you're betting against Australia, you're probably betting against banks. That's the, the, yeah. the way you do it as a big, big fund. Yeah. But look, I think you know they've been badly left behind. They've done their raisings. They, they were due a bounce, and mm. and as we said here last Friday, I think that I think last Friday we were surprised they didn't bounce on the job the job mm. uh, last Monday, mm. yep. the job yep. keeper, and then the next week they did obviously. Yeah. So look, I don't know. I think it's reflective. It's the same as the Aussie dollar. Aussie dollar's rallying because the outcomes in Australia were nowhere near as bad as the rest of the world or feared. Mm. And I think look, banks do fit into that too as a GDP proxy on Australia. Yeah. And Paul, someone tweeted that these bank bulls, and they named at. Paul Rickard and that piece with so we, we, he reckons that us bank bulls will one day you know, rue the, the day that we actually were bank bulls. 
I'm not ruining that day, Peter. I mean, look, I think banks now, are, look, I mean, you saw it today, the market started off soft, banks got hit hard, early, bounced back. So, I mean, they are sort of going up and down with the market a little bit. I think what's interesting, to Peter, is uh, the observation about how Australia's now seen globally. We're, if anything, becoming, I won't say a safe haven, but, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges in America are actually probably good for, for the Aussie. And you've got to remember, the Aussie dollar's had a big rally, up from almost 55 cents to 66 it's cents. Well. Yeah, a lot of overseas investors yeah. uh, have made a lot of money in Australia. So uh, they're looking pretty, pretty comfortable about Aussie. Well, it was surprising, a bit of Hong Kong money's coming here. And a bit of Hong Kong money. So you've got a lot of things, which is probably the other reason to explain why we're staying up. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, um, uh, this is the final one, is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's the show for this week. Uh, I'd like to thank Charlie Aiken and Paul Rickard. Thank you as well for joining us. See you next week.